every single political commentator in America, every single one of them knows this, that if you do not step out and say things that are radically pro-Israel, or if you are too quiet on certain narratives and they want you to be radically pro-Israel, you can lose everything. Media spaces have been divided by this war. We, I know uh, when we've spoken before, George, how you deplore all forms of racism and surely anti-Semitism is a form of racism. And this issue is continually used to create division. It's created division in an emergent peripheral anti-establishment right wing movement that was growing in America, mostly in the kind of media spaces that you and I are now familiar with. Commentators like Stephen Crowder and Ben Shapiro and Tucker Carlson. We We've just heard that Candace Owens has left the Daily Wire, no doubt because, in part, because of the stance she's taken on this particular war and the perspective that the Daily Wire and its affiliation with the faith of Judaism and the nation of Israel, understandable given the founders, has caused rifts and division in a space that was starting to coalesce around anti-establishmentism. Also, on the left, George, what I find fascinating is that, that many groups and individuals that were unwilling willing to talk up on the matter of censorship and media control are starting to notice that when it comes to the subject of Palestine and in particular this conflict, there is a great deal of censorship, with many people arguing that part of the reason that the US government wants to bring down TikTok is because it's a place where reporting on Gaza has been accurate and revealing. So this conflict is very, very unique and shows us the nature of the challenge we now face, because if there is to be success against the Uniparty, party, it seems to me that communities that are directly opposed on important issues are going to have to find common ground if we're going to make a dent in the significant power of that party. Do you see alliances as being a, poss a possibility, George? And are you looking to make those kind of alliances? Uh, well, first of all, free speech has to be that common ground. Uh, I have to be able to speak my truth on Israel-Palestine. And uh, Shapiro uh, has to uh, be able to speak his. I can't close him down. He can't close me down. If we get into the business, in the anti-establishment periphery that you talk about, of actually turning on each other's right to speak, uh, then we have no chance whatsoever of uh, dealing the uni party, the globalists, the real deep-seated problem that we have. We're not chance of turning them over, no chance of replacing them. So free speech has to be the common ground. I happen to believe that even in the last 48 hours, uh, there's reason to believe that some elements of the right of that anti-establishment periphery are uh, coming around to my point of view on Israel-Palestine. Alec Jones, for example, is now uh, to the left of Joe Biden. Uh, the um, Tucker Carlson in the last 24 hours, Candace Owens in the uh, last uh, two or three, four weeks. These are people that are not of the left, uh, but they are people who were a part of our periphery uh, who are now beginning to challenge uh, what was the prevailing orthodoxy on the right on this question. Uh, and I'm very glad about that, especially people who said, America first. You can't say America first if it's actually Israel first, because Israel might do things that are not in America's interests. But if you have already given them a blank check, a green light, then they're going to go. And indeed, Netanyahu today has said that whatever the Americans say, he's going to invade uh, the tent city of Rafa uh, with his army. What could possibly go wrong? There's only 1.7 million people living there in tents. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, but yes, alliances, if not electoral alliances, then an alliance that we must defend each other's right to speak freely uh, is, I think, a precondition of progress. We can't continue to bring you this glorious content without the support of our partners. And what great partners they are today. Debt. It keeps you tossing and turning at night. You can't get away from it. But the truth is the system is designed to trap you in perennial debt. Insanely high interest credit cards and loans make it nearly impossible to pay off your debt. But thankfully, there's a new way out of the debt 
trap pivotal debt solutions pivotal debt solutions isn't like the old school debt relief companies that string your debt out for years they have new aggressive strategies that can end your debt faster and easier than you ever thought possible pivotal debt solutions can cut or even eliminate interest find programs to write off your balances so you owe less stop those threatening phone calls without bankruptcy and without a loan. The bottom line is they find every solution possible to end your debt permanently. Before you do anything, contact Pivotal Debt Solutions first. Talk to them for free. Find out how fast they can help you get out of debt. Visit zapmydebt.com. That's zapmydebt.com. Okay, let's get back to the content. To give Tucker Carlson his due, as a matter of fact, I've always known him to be anti-war across the board. A lot of, indeed, American nativists or America first uh, pundits and political figures, while dismissed widely as racist, often seem to me to be nationalist in a somewhat 20th century sense, not the worst kind of national socialism sense I'm, I'm keen to add, but just that they believe in the people of their nation. And if nation is something that's real, surely there could be some kind of bargain, pact, agreement that were there to be controls on migration, controls on the border, this must surely be accompanied by a strong anti-war commitment not to intervene and intercede and disrupt those nations from which migrants tend to come. And of course, I know that what's important to you, George, is that those nations are losing many of their best and brightest doctors, medics and professionals as well as the many economic migrants, refugees, however that you want to describe them. Do you consider it to be interesting, George, the possibility that um, a non-imperialist, non-interventionist model, i.e. an anti-globalist model, might mean don't get involved in wars, don't get involved in exploiting the resources of these countries, and therefore it seems more reasonable and practical to manage borders sensibly? Because I know that people might be surprised to hear some of your views on migration. Yeah, perfectly put. That is the case. Uh, only a fool or an anarchist or a, or, or a very, very rich man uh, could possibly want open borders. Uh, I, I, I'm the leader of the workers. So part of my job, a very important part of it, is to raise the price of labor, uh, the price of work. And of course, to do that, I have to control the supply of labor. Otherwise, the price of work will plummet. The pressure on the public services, uh, council housing, national health service, places, places in the schools, in the nurseries and so on, will become broken. It will become impossible for the people I represent, who are, of course, of all colors. We are a multicolored, multicultural country. So there's nothing racist about it. In fact, the, the free movement of labor that we had before Brexit was white labor from the European Union. It had nothing to do with color or race. It had to do with the supply of labor. And with an endless supply of labor, you have a constantly falling price of labor. Obviously, if I'm the trade union official negotiating with the factory owner, and he tells me I've got 5,000 Bulgarians outside who are going to do the job cheaper than your members, I'm finished. I could use another F word, but won't. Uh, the, the reality is that this tendency of liberals, and they are liberals actually, small l liberals, uh, to apply ists and isms as pejoratives uh, to ordinary people merely standing up for their own interest is one of the reasons why leftism has such a bad name. And I'm one of those who no longer wants to hear myself described as a leftist because left has become synonymous with liberalism, with license, uh, with open borders, uh, with, uh, you know, refugees welcome here and so on. All this is inimical to the interests of the working class of all colors who are already here. Now, you are quite right to identify that one of the drivers of mass immigration 
of flows of refugees is the endless making of war on the poor countries of the global south, whether it's full out hot war or economic war or overthrowing popular governments, replacing them with dictatorships like in Latin America, for example. Uh, that's what's causing many of these refugee flows. If you stop making war on them, give them a hand up to build their own economies and their own societies, invest a bit in them, the number of people who want to leave their country will be far fewer. Look, I'm an example. Um, my grandparents came here as Irish refugees from hunger, from famine. If there's no famine, my grandparents, great-grandparents would never have wanted to leave Ireland. Anyone who's been in Ireland, been in Scotland, knows that Ireland's better. So <laughs> if, 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 you, if you hadn't been driven out of Ireland, you wouldn't be here in the first place. So what, I'm, what I am very interested in is a de facto alliance uh, between the people like Tucker, who are uh, American firstists, who are nativists, if you like. There's no reason for hostility between him and me. I have no interest in the domestic politics of the United States of America. I just don't want them to come here. I don't want them to bomb here or there or elsewhere. I don't want them interfering in other people's countries. I take my hat off to Tucker Carlson. He's, I mean, you and I are both in the broadcasting game. He is captain, my captain. I take my hat off to him. And I like some of the things that he says, dislike some of the other things that he says. But I'm always listening, aren't you? Absolutely, I am, because I think these are exactly the kind of relationships that need to be explored. Indeed, in a truly representative system, there would be freedom for a, a degree of true diversity culturally and economically, not just within nations, but within regions, if decentralisation were part of the shared goal. Full autonomy, maximum autonomy, maximum representation. Now, we've spent a lot of time at the early part of our conversation talking about how particularly fractious, historic, religious and potent the conflict in Gaza is, how it's defined politics for more than a generation, it's defined politics for millennia, that it reaches into culture, that it reaches into economics and ideologies. Even in new emergent spaces where there were uh, extraordinary affiliations starting to form, The in particular, I mean, what is known somewhat glibly perhaps as the alt-right. You had figures like Ben Shapiro and Candace Owens forming alliances. Now, Candace Owens has just left the Daily Wire, presumably because of differences around this conflict. I wonder what it means when Ben Shapiro and Candace Owens, on the subject of this war in particular, can't find a way of allowing each other free speech, of coming together in unity. What does it tell us? Is there something unique about this conflict? It's become divisive in places where there was at least a burgeoning sense of potential mm. unity and real opposition. Well, it, yeah, it ought not to uh, have been a deal breaker on the issue of free speech. Uh, Candace and Ben Shapiro have uh, quite similar views on a lot of things. And ought to have been able to live with their difference on this subject. As I said earlier, uh, Tucker Carlson, Alec Jones, and Candace Owen are all moving in this direction towards my position. And I find that very interesting and very significant and actually inevitable. I, I honestly can't understand how anyone can look at the pictures and videos that I'm looking at, and they are presumably looking at. Uh, and uh, come to any, any other conclusion, unless you believe in exceptionalism, you see, unless you believe that some of us are more exceptional than others, some of us are chosen and therefore some of us by definition are not. If you believe that, uh, then you'll believe anything. And if you believe that, you'll believe that the inferior will have to bow down to the superior, the unexceptional, bowing down to the exceptional. And I'm religiously uh, forbidden to believe in such things, as well as politically disinclined to do so. 
Uh, so I, I don't think it's the issue itself. It's the issue of exceptionalism. Mm. This is where my religion and my politics uh, merge. Uh, because I believe that all of us are God's children, that none of us are exceptional, that none of us are God's chosen people, that we are all God's chosen people, then we need to make a world that is fair and equitable. It won't happen overnight. But it's another of the reasons why I oppose mass immigration, to which you alluded earlier. The people of Bangladesh shouldn't have to leave Bangladesh. Bangladesh should be such a beautiful and harmonious and prosperous place that we might be lucky to move to Bangladesh. That's the world I'm fighting for. And I ask everyone to join that fight. Hey, thanks for watching. If you want to see more uncensored content where free speech can flourish, join our live stream. Click the link right here to watch the next video if you want to, or become a member of a growing movement. Download the Rumble app and you'll be informed every time we make a new piece of content. Stay free.